The Leap of Faith on RTE Radio 1. Well, Michael Nugent is an Irish writer and activist. He's written three books, co-written two, and was one of the three writers of the comedy musical play Aikino. He's campaigned on many political issues, often with his late wife Anne Holiday, and he's chairperson of the advocacy group Atheist Ireland, and he's our guest tonight on The Leap of Faith. Michael, can I begin by asking you, when did you make the leap of faith to atheism? Well... Obviously, uh, I would dispute the word faith in the context of atheism. I see faith as uh, believing things disproportionately to the currently best available evidence and believing it because you want to believe it or because you're afraid not to believe it. You know, you wouldn't say I have faith I'm going to get hit by a bus as I cross the road. It's something that you want to happen and it's disproportionate to the evidence. Now, I think that if you look at the evidence for the existence of God's and you look at the evidence that the idea of gods was invented by humans at an earlier time in history to explain things that we didn't yet understand, that on the balance of probabilities, there is no god. My parents were, I suppose, what you'd call cultural Catholics. You know, they were involved in the Catholic community, but they didn't really uh, take the theology as seriously as some Catholics did. They didn't insist that we go to mass. Uh, they uh, introduced us to various worldviews and encouraged us to make up our own minds. Uh, my late wife was an Anglo-Irish Protestant from Limerick. So she kind of introduced me to the concept of what she described as the forgotten minority on the island, that after partition you had essentially a sectarian Protestant state in the north, a sectarian Catholic state in the south. But whereas there were enough Catholics in the north to more or less keep it a contested space, the Protestants in the Republic ended up keeping their heads down. So I, I, I would have been familiar with, you know, both of the traditions, the main Christian traditions on, on the island of Ireland. Um, but, but, but out of that, and indeed out of that, plus the other religious beliefs that, that I checked myself and read up on, including, you know, Islam and Judaism and Hinduism and so on, that, that, that it just seems that, that the, the more religious beliefs that there are, the more likely it is that they're all invented stories. Um, because as, as, as Homer Simpson said to, uh, to Marge in The Simpsons when she was trying to get him to go to Mass, but uh, what if we pick the wrong religion, Marge? Every week we're just making God madder and madder. Yeah. So if there is a God, you've got to make sure you've got the right one. Michael, you have a point about going from agnostic to atheist. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that... Um, Atheism and agnosticism are two different things, that there's a kind of a scale and, and that at one end of the scale you have a theist, at the other end of the scale you have an atheist and somewhere in the middle you have agnostic, which I don't really know. But actually they're different areas of discourse. Atheism and theism are about what you believe. Do you believe there's a God? Do you believe there isn't a God? Agnosticism is about what you claim to be able to know. So you can be an agnostic and an atheist, which I am. Uh, I, I am an atheist because I strongly believe there are no gods and I'm an agnostic because I don't claim to be able to know that. As against being a Gnostic atheist who would be absolutely sure and certain in their belief. Exactly. And, and yeah. I think that's another mistake that people make about atheism. People equate atheism with certainty. Virtually every atheist that I know is quite open to the idea that if we got new evidence, we would change our yes, minds. Yes, but you will probably admit too that there are a couple of people in the in the in the in the movement who are quite definite in their in their attitude towards people of faith. They, they have a superior attitude towards them. There are indeed, and, and there are people of faith who have those type of attitudes towards atheists, and you'll, you'll find that everywhere. But if, if you focus on the beliefs and issues rather than on the individuals, I, I, I think you'll find that you can be an atheist and an agnostic, and you can be a strong atheist or a strong theist and still respect other individuals. Where does the humanist fit into the model? Well, humanism is kind of like an, an overlap to a certain extent. Humanists, uh, in terms of secular humanists today, um, would say, well, on top of atheism, we're adding a specific set of values. Uh, but I, I think most atheists, particularly ethical atheists, would share those values anyway. Now, two weeks ago, you were talking in Trinity about people encouraging people, in fact, to read the Bible. Yes, I would say read the Bible. I would also say read the Quran. I would say read all of the, these sacred texts. And if you read the Bible, you will find, for example, how the Jesus uh, character in the Bible evolved from what was essentially in, in the letters of Paul, which were chronologically the first uh, part of the, of the New Testament he written. 
Paul was talking about a Jesus who, whose relationship with God came from his resurrection. Uh, when you come to the first of the Gospels, Jesus uh, again was a human, but his, his, his relationship with God came from his baptism with John the Baptist. When you come to Matthew and Luke, written a little bit later, it's come back to his conception. And when you read John, he was there from the beginning. So you can see if you follow the chronology, not in the order in which they, the books appear in the Bible, but in the chronological order in which they were written, you can see how the story evolved. And if you look at it objectively, you can see that there in all probability was one or more characters on whom the story was based, but that gradually the theological aspects were added over the decades. Is this a human flaw, human weakness that you perceive that we need something bigger than ourselves? Well, there is something bigger than ourselves. And what there is bigger than ourselves is the universe. And the universe contains a thousand million galaxies, each of which has over a thousand million stars like our sun. So the universe is vast and much more awe-inspiring than the, the kind of parochial stories that humans come up with when they legitimately at the time thought that the Earth was the centre of everything. We now know that our place in the overall scheme of things is, uh, is pretty insignificant and the, the idea that all of this was created for the benefit of human beings and planet Earth is pretty uh, self-centred and, and fanciful. So I, I think there is something bigger than ourselves and I think that with science we can have a much better understanding of how much bigger everything is than we are than we had with religion religious stories from 2000 years ago. So where's the gripe? Well, firstly, I think that uh, faith itself is a problem. I think if you base your life on believing things disproportionately to the evidence, then you're more likely to come to flawed conclusions about the truth and about morality. Now, I don't restrict that just to religion. You know, you can have faith in communism. You can have faith in the unregulated free market. You know, you can have faith in all sorts of secular projects and we see the problems that that causes if people don't use critical thinking and evidence based thinking. But the difference between religious faith and secular based faith is that with, say, faith in the unregulated free market, it eventually bumps into reality. People notice that it's not working and they say, OK, we've got to change our thinking. Whereas religious faith hides its testability in an imaginary afterlife. And so it, it sort of gets away from this reality check that, that other, other faiths have. So that's the first reason that I think it's important to, to challenge religious faith uh, more than others. The second is, I think that it corrupts our sense of morality. I think that morality is essentially about um, how we treat each other. It's about uh, evolved traits like empathy and compassion and fairness and justice and cooperation and reciprocity. And I think that if we base our faith on the, or, or sorry, if we base our morality on those, then we, we're, we're going to have the type of ethical society that we would all like to work towards. Whereas if we add into that mix, and it's already a difficult enough challenge to say what's the most ethical thing to do. If you add into that mix uh, instructions that are supposedly revealed by the creator of the universe to somebody 2000 years ago that aren't based on compassion or empathy. And there might be a, a belief that they have updated their thinking, but they still hold a central uh, premise that there is somebody bigger than themselves or something bigger than themselves as, the cre as a creator. Well, there's a huge distinction between those last two words you said, something bigger than ourselves completely agree with someone bigger than ourselves that's where you, you, you make the distinction look we don't know what happened before the Big Bang we know what happened since the Big Bang we know how uh, life evolved since it, it, it came on earth we don't know how life started on earth we, we don't know how consciousness works there are various things that we don't know that, that are significantly you know bigger than ourselves in terms of things that we would like to know but, but the distinction between a scientific approach to those things that we don't yet know and a religious approach is that with, with the scientific approach, what you do is you, you, you try to prove your theories wrong. You know, you, you don't just just say this is what I want to be true and therefore I will, I will convince myself. But is it myself not easy for an atheist to turn and say there isn't anything there as against prove that there is something there? Well, it's easier because it's more reasonable. Anything that I say, I believe I am always happy to say that I might be mistaken. I'm always open to new evidence. I'm always open to changing my mind based on new evidence. I have no vested interest in there being no God. If there, if there was a God, I would just say, OK, I was mistaken. OK, well, let's play, play the game of numbers for just a moment mm -hmm. in that you look at Ireland in 2015 and there aren't a phenomenal amount of people declaring heart and soul as being non-believers of being atheists. There are a lot of people still holding on to a faith, even if it's as an insurance policy. Well, the last census um, gave figures of over a quarter of a million people. Yeah, but only 6,000 no of those actually said they were atheists. The rest were non-believers. Well, that, that's a flaw in the census question. What mm. the census question says is, what is your religion? Mm. Um, and then it lists the, the last five most frequent answers from the previous one. And then there's a box saying, 
other religion, if any. Now, some, exactly. some small number of people wrote the word atheist into the box other religion. Yeah. Now, given that atheism isn't a religion, those people were either making a protest or for whatever reason chose to do it, but that's not representative of the actual uh, number and of And we atheists don't know how many people put in Jedi Knight either, but 84% of them put themselves down as Catholic and 270,000 put themselves down as Church of Ireland. So there is still a, a, a yearning for people to at least hold on to the identity. Well, the identity, yes, but whether you uh, see that identity as cultural or as uh, religious is a different thing. We've, we've completed nearly 50 weeks of, of this kind of programme on our digital channel. And one of the things that I can certainly say to you after that period of time is we meet people time after time saying, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Mm. What does an atheist say to those people? Well, what I would say, I'm sure different atheists might say different things, is, is that spiritual just seems like a made up word for an intense emotional and psychological experience. Now, nobody doubts that those experiences exist, but different people will attribute different meanings to those experiences. And it's the attributing of the different meanings that, that we would have a, a difficulty with rather than the existence of, of the experiences. Mm. And so then when it comes to the, the, the standard question, which I'm sure you've dealt with before, which is that you've got parents of a sick child in a hospital and they turn and say, pray for my child. What do, you, what do you say to them? Well, there was a study done in America of people recovering from open heart surgery, which is the most comprehensive study of the efficacy of, of prayer in an intercessionary mode. And it found not only that those prayer not make any difference as they would have expected. But they also tested in terms of the placebo effect, you know, whether if somebody knew they were being prayed for, would that help them? And they discovered that people who knew they were being prayed for suffered more complications during recovery. So it actually added a level of stress. Yeah, but you know, Michael, that wasn't my question about you, the, whether the efficacy of prayer or otherwise. It was what do you say to a human being who at that moment is reaching out for some, for some form of comfort or support? What you say is, I love you. Uh, what you say is, well, what, well, uh, what I can say is what I did when my wife was dying. We, we said to each other, we reminded each other that, that we loved each other. We reminded each other of the life that we have had, how lucky we are to have had the chance to spend any time on the earth, given the odds against either of us existing, certainly given the odds against us meeting each other and we loved each other greatly. And, and everybody unfortunately at some stage is, is going to die it's part of life and the idea that we won't be around uh, for centuries to come is no more a concern than the idea that we weren't around before we were born I remember when my wife was dying one of the things that she said to me when we were cuddling up in bed together one morning with the three cats around us and just, just generally uh, just enjoying a loving moment and she said to me um, you know I'm, I'm really going to miss this and, and then she realised what she said and she paused and she said actually I'm not you're going to miss this and I, I think that's really the, 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 the key to it. I mean, what, what, when somebody is, is suffering or, or dying, when they die, they're released from that pain. And it's up to the rest of us to carry on as, as, as best that we, we can. You're back from Warsaw. Uh, you were at a conference there and you raised a, an issue, which is that atheists in Ireland are in receipt of discrimination. Yeah, and overtly so. And the, and the state claims that it is constitutionally obliged to discriminate against us. If you want to be president in Ireland or a judge or Taoiseach, you have to swear a religious oath. The Catholic Church runs 90% of our primary schools and does it with exemptions from our equality laws that allows them to discriminate against teachers, against pupils. There are other exemptions in our equality laws that, that increase the discrimination. And we have a blasphemy law. We're one of the few uh, countries in the Western world that has a new blasphemy law passed in, in the 21st century that, that Pakistan has cited uh, in the United Nations as best practice uh, for, for blasphemy laws. So, so we have a country that discriminates overtly against atheists, but the discrimination is invisible. Because most people are, are just, it's what we grew up with. But if you reverse any of those, if you were to imagine that in order to become president of Ireland, you had to swear that there's no God, or if there were schools actively teaching children of Catholics that there is no God, we'd immediately realise it's wrong. Uh, Richard Dawkins. In a recent uh, video I was looking at him, described that rid ridicule was a legitimate weapon, as was sarcasm and comedy, in order to put fa people of faith in their place. Is that necessarily going to win hearts and minds to your belief? Well, I think uh, ridicule is an important weapon in challenging bad ideas. I don't think ridiculing people is a good idea. I think we, sh we should respect people's right to believe whatever they believe. We should respect that people have come to their beliefs honestly and, and that it, it is the basis of their life. So we should, we should respect that about them. But if the beliefs themselves are flawed uh, and if the beliefs are, are so um, uh, unlikely as, as the idea that if, if you consider the size of the universe that we described earlier, you know, the idea that the creator of all of that 
vast universe uh, did it in order that he might come to one tiny planet and impregnate a virgin in order to give birth to himself is an idea that I think is worthy of ridicule. Now, that's not ridicule the people. It's ridiculing an idea that people believed at an earlier stage of the evolution of, 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 of humankind. And I think that's valid. Michael, one other thing finally to talk to you about is the idea that people in Ireland are currently baptising children or having children brought into a faith purely for educational purposes. Well, it's outrageous, obviously. I mean, if, if you put it the other way around again, if, if you could imagine a, a child trying to get into their local publicly funded school and the principal saying, um, yeah, that's fine, there's a space here for you, but uh, but we noticed that your child is a Catholic, you know, you'll have to get him excommunicated before we let him into the school. You know, people would immediately realise that that's outrageous. But that's only part of the problem. Even if you do get access to the school, you're still discriminated against within the school because the, the school uses an integrated religious curriculum that integrates one faith belief into the entire school day. And, and that's uh, part of the, the rules for national schools. So there's a, there's a range of things with it. It's probably the most important thing, the education system. Reform of the education system is the key to building an ethical, secular society where everybody is treated equally, where everybody has the right to believe what they want, um, but that the state, in order to protect everybody's right to believe what they want, remains neutral itself. Now, as an activist, what is your vision of Ireland, say, five, ten years down the road, in, in if you have achieved your goals? Well, first I'll say that the world is becoming more secular uh, and, and there's research to show that, that, that and that is happening. What happens is as people move away from survival values towards self-expression values, um, that enables societies to move away from traditional religious values and towards secular rational values. That's triggered by things like investment in health, education, communications, technology and moves towards greater participation in democracy. So that's happening. It's going to happen. It's just a question of how long it takes. How it should manifest itself in Ireland, I think, is a more multicultural society with, with uh, more different religious views represented and the state being neutral in order to protect everybody's right to believe what they want, whether that be a religious view or a non-religious philosophical view. And that will involve constitutional change and changes in our laws. Michael Nugent, Chairperson of Atheist Ireland, thank you for joining us on The Leap of Faith. The Leap of Faith on RTE Radio 1.